it's a special pleasure to introduce our next speaker to you. You probably know his work. Um, the Linux distribution GNOME and also the frameworks Mono and Xamarin that brought uh, the .NET uh, framework to open source and uh, mobile. And here to talk about bringing the programming language Swift to Godot, please welcome Miguel de Icasa. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you folks. Um, this is a reference to a famous quote about fixing the billion dollar mistake. I didn't remember the quote at the beginning and I put million, it should be billion. Uh, we're going to go with that. Uh, before we get started, how many of you are Unity refugees? <laughs> All right. Good, good, good. Uh, how many of you have actually done some Unity development? Not. All right. OK. And how many of you love the Mac as much as I do? All right. Good, good. So Windows people. All right. I'm sorry for you. Uh, Intel people, I feel very sorry for you. Uh, the what? Well, yes, yes, yes. Anyways, uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background, uh, of a background uh, as to what I want to talk today, uh, the mistake that I think that needs to be solved, then a quick intro for people that are not familiar with Swift or might not know what Apple has been up to with Swift. Uh, then I'm going to show you how you can use Swift in your Godot application as another language uh, for Godot. And then something that I've been pondering for the last couple of weeks that it's a little bit controversial, and we'll get to that. At the end. So just so you know, so you don't, so you don't walk out of here like, well, I listened to this talk from a crank and you know, completely insane guy. Uh, I just want to tell you, I've done a few things in the past. I founded the GNOME project with Federico Mena. I started the Mono project uh, to bring .NET to uh, to Linux. I fell in love with .NET in the winter of 2000 after a paper came out, and I started to clone it right away. And I couldn't clone it without documentation. So I put the project on hold until April. And then I continued with the cloning effort. I've started two companies around this. The first was Zemian. I run the Linux desktop and GNOME. And the second one is Xamarin. I run Mono on mobile. And, uh, and these days, uh, uh, you know, my second company, Xamarin, it got acquired by Microsoft. And we've merged Mono and .NET Core into one. Now they're part of the same distribution. And uh, I spent a lot of time working on runtimes, libraries, SDK, anything that has to do with developer tools. So I don't have a lot of pretty pictures. I don't have nice demos and visualizations like the other folks. Uh, this is going to be mostly zeros and ones, um, uh, but I think it matters. So in the mid-2000s, we realized that, uh, that we, had a, we, were, we were trying to push Mono for Linux desktop applications. And we found that there was a very interesting niche market, which was uh, game developers were using scripting languages, all sorts of scripting languages. Lua was very popular. There were lots of other ones. And uh, they were kind of slow. In fact, Unity came to us initially uh, because they were using Python on Unity, and it was very, very slow. Remember, this is 2000, you know, this is a long time ago. Um, and it was very slow. And what Mono ga gave them, and this was it, this one's not even modern Mono. This is very primitive Mono. It had very simple JIT compiler. And even then, it provided a massive performance boost over what was available at the time. And, um, and uh, so we started to push Mono in the gaming space uh, because it was a solution for a bunch of different problems. So we licensed Mono to Electronic Arts for the Sims 3. That was a massive win for us. Uh, we worked with Unity extensively over many years to adjust Mono, adapt Mono, and meet the needs of the Unity people for doing c -sharp scripting. Uh, we worked with many, many years for them. Then we did the Mono Touch on the iPhone, um, which led to a bunch of games being built directly on Mono game or uh, using other technologies. We put, uh, we work with Sony to put C Sharp on every PlayStation and the uh, and the Vita. Oh, sorry, I have to point this way, the Vita. Um, and uh, we've ship, uh, we've helped a bunch of studios uh, 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 ship games with Mono Game, and we put Mono on Unreal. Long story, we don't, we're not in speaking terms with uh, Tim Sweeney anymore. He's not a good guy. Um, <laughs> and we also, and we also funded uh, the work to put C Sharp in Godot. So. I went, got the money, and paid for Godot for a few years. I'm not sure where we are right now, but uh, we paid for the initial work to get C Sharp into Godot because we really liked C Sharp, and I really believed in this dream. Um, but um, but there's a few, you know, there's a few things that I've always hoped we could fix. Uh, there's a few things that I wish that we could fix that we really never got to, and uh, and you might get an idea of what that is. 
Um, and I collected a sample of, you know, a few of the problems that people face with, uh, with mono. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this was just a sampler. And I know where you're thinking, we don't have this problem with Godot, and we do. So, in fact, just today, my first interaction of the day, the moment I walked into the building, we were having a nice uh, coffee, and I asked a gentleman, and I said, you know, he said, I switched from Unity uh, to Godot, and I said, nice to meet you. Do you ever have any problems with the GC in Godot? He says, who doesn't? Right, that was his first reaction. So let me explain to you why this is a problem, why does it happen. So let me explain what the problem is. Um, when you're running a, a game, right, so let's say this is your memory, this is the memory uh, for your application, the way that a garbage collector works is essentially you allocate, you allocate, you allocate, you allocate some more, create more stuff, you download a file, you do a URL, you do a new string, you do something, and eventually you run out of memory. And the garbage collector at this point decides, okay, I gotta clean up some garbage. I gotta get rid of the stuff that is not actually in use. So what you do is an operation called stop the world. And the reason we have to stop the world is because multi-threaded runtimes like uh, Mono or Java or Go, they have multiple threads running. And you can have people behind your back creating objects, destroying objects, or making objects point elsewhere. Right, so you gotta have a, a, a stable place to, to start from. And this is a process called stop the world. So you stop every thread. And there's all kinds of mechanisms that we, we're not gonna get into, but you stop the world, you make sure that the system is stable, and then you start poking at things. And what you do is you start tracing. You start tracing the memory, and you figure out which ones of this, uh, of this oh, there was a nice animation. Oh, so you start flagging everything that is not used, right? So you identify everything that is not used, and you identify the things that are used. And then you copy that stuff, right? So you start copying all the stuff to a new location, and you essentially end up with this, you know, free space at the end that you can continue using, right? This is a general principle. There's a lot more details. We don't have time to get into those, but um, I could spend a semester talking about this, but this is the general idea. And once you're done, one important thing is that during this process, you've got to update every pointer that you had in memory you had to update every pointer that you had in memory to the new locations, right? So we moved the data, right? So if you had a pointer that said it's a 0x ABC, and then I moved it elsewhere, I got to change that pointer to the new location, right? Um, this matters because fixing bugs related to a moving garbage collector, if you don't know what you're doing, is very, very hard. Because at one point, the object points to something that is not it, and you have no idea why. And sometimes it might look okay, but it's not. So anyways, so. To make a long story short, this is the reality, and there's ins and outs and what have you, but there is no GC that exists today in .NET or in Unity or in the Coursera or in any of these things that can prevent this thing. None of this can do it. What you can do is you can apply multiple band-aids, and there are many good band-aids that you can apply, but you really can't do much. Right? There is no good control to say, I want to run the collector, you know, I have some spare cycles right now because, you know, I blow up the enemy, I'm running a simulation or, you know, I'm, you know, some sparkles on the screen, I can distract the user and I can run it. There's really nothing good to run this thing. And I know where you're thinking, what about, yes, we've tried every what about you can think of. Um, and the big problem is by the time that you realize that you have a problem, it's too late. You've written all of your game code, and then, well, the thing is pausing. So your game is pausing, the game is stuttering, and there's nothing you can do. So you embark yourself in a quest to find out who is generating the garbage, why is the garbage being created, right? So, uh, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with this expression. In Mexico, we call it um, uh, la mona aunque se vista de seda, mona se queda. In, in English is, you know, it's lipstick on a pig. You, it's, it's, a, it's a pig and you can make it look prettier, but it's still a pig, right? So there's a lot of solutions that people have come up with, like for example, don't allocate objects during gameplay. Allocate everything before, and then during gameplay, don't allocate. It's okay, it works sometimes, but really no. Um, or people say just use a pool of objects. Don't allocate objects, just pull them. Yeah, there's a laugh there and there's a crash that I saw yesterday about this the other day. Or just use span of T. Right? You just got to be a better engineer. Uh, you know, it's a different variation of the pig. These are really nice pigs. In fact, I would even adopt one. Uh, we just need good discipline at the team. The team just needs to learn to not allocate. Right? That's another one. Or, you know, collect on every scene load. 
as long as we don't allocate between scenes, we'll be fine, right? So just at the end of the scene, do the collection and then, you know, get ready. Or the best one is it won't happen to us, right? We're a seasoned team. I was talking to a gentleman earlier today that said we adopted a navigation system and the problem is that it blew allocations, right? And then my CTO said, well, what can we do? Is there anything that we can do to minimize? And he says, well, I mean, after spending hours profiling, it's, well, let's not use it, <laughs> right? Let's build a new navigation system that doesn't locate. But essentially, it shows that um, as you build your program, you will end up pulling a third-party library, or you will uh, let an engineer do a bug fix or add a feature, and, la the la the, and the next thing you know, you're allocating again, and you're pausing again, and you're, uh, yeah, again. So all that we have today really are stopgap measures, right? So like I said, you can apply all kinds of band-aids, um, but you also need to constantly monitor. So you need somebody in your team to be constantly profiling, making sure that you do not regress. And if you ship a bug fix, do not regress, right? And it's very hard to track these things. You introduce this tiny allocation and then every, all of your effort is gone away. We dealt with these problems for years. So, um, so Unity might be the vendor, but we got the brunt of the complaints. It's like, why does Mono not fix this problem? We wrote another garbage collector. We tried to fund the effort. It's too much money. It's too much money to fund. There is no interest in funding it. Nobody wants to do this work. I tried. I tried and I failed. I think it could be funded, but it's going to take years to implement, fund, and roll out. So this is a challenge that we're facing. Um, then, um, um, and uh, you know, just anecdotally, every once in a while, when I have my Swift game and I leave it overnight running and I, I forget about it, and, and there's other problems with, with the GCs in, in .NET, but every once in a while I leave it uh, overnight running and the next one is like, oh, shoot, I left this thing running, right? But the nice thing is that the memory usage is still flat, right? Xcode shows you the memory usage and it, it was flat overnight. It's like, oh, oh I forgot what it felt like, right? So, <laughs> so um, now I'm going to tell you why I like Swift. Um, and uh, Swift is a language created by Apple to target and build applications for their platforms. Um, and my first reaction when they launched it, I was selling a product called uh, Monotouch, or might have been called Xamarin at this point. But we were selling essentially C Sharp for Android and iOS, and it was great. It was selling like hot pancakes because, um, because iOS had Objective-C, which is a terrible low-level language, and people were just miserable. So we were selling this thing like hot pancakes. And then Apple launches this thing, it's like, God damn it. You know, internally it's like, oh, this is not good. This is not good. Um, and uh, so the reality is that my first reaction to Swift is, is, well, this is bad for C Sharp, right? I wanted C Sharp to become the language of choice for Mac developers and iOS developers. Like, well, that opportunity is probably gone now, uh, but it's still a terrible language. C Sharp is better, right? Um, but actually it wasn't. So we started borrowing uh, at this point. You know, I was, about, uh, I was at Xamarin. We got acquired by Microsoft. And at Microsoft, we started uh, taking a lot of features from Swift. So there's a lot of features that you have now in C Sharp that were borrowed directly from Swift. Uh, in fact, Swift kind of forced the C Sharp people to say, we got to do optional types, right? Because this is a source of a lot of problems. That's the actual billion dollar problem. That's a lot of problems. So we spent years designing that thing and folding it into the language. It is not perfect because it, it was kind of a thing that was laid on top of it. So it's not great, but it works. But anyways, um, we did take a lot of features from Swift, and they're still taking features from Swift. And I think it's great because C Sharp is a fantastic language. I still use it every day for all my server stuff. Um, but uh, you know, like I was, uh, I was meeting uh, last weekend with a with a uh, with an economist, and uh, and she came up with a new theory that is very neat on how the economy works. And, uh, and she was saying, you know, the problem with all this, uh, somebody asked why didn't big name economists embrace it. And it's like the problem is that a lot of people have their reputation and egos on the line, right? They've been telling for years people, uh, you know, this is the way the economy works and this new theory kind of destroys this, right? And it's funny because they kind of acknowledge its existence but say it's wrong, but they don't say why. So they walk this thin line of weaselness. Um, uh, and even Nobel Prize winners around this thing because, uh, because it's wrong. So anyways, I don't want to be like these economists that don't, can't admit that they're wrong. And, and I really think that Swift 
is a great solution for the gaming space. So, um, so how to think about Swift if you've never seen Swift before? Um, you know, just think of it as as it's like it's very similar to C Sharp in Spirit. It has classes. It has almost everything that you've come to to love. Uh, there's a couple of things that are you know I have a couple of the of the top of the, the things that are very similar with uh, with C Sharp. Um, one important thing is that it's LVM based. Oh, it is LVM based. Things that you might not know is that Apple open sourced these things. They are running a pretty good open source project. I am impressed. I'm impressed at how well they run it, uh, especially after coming from Microsoft, where it's like, you know, we do open source, but it's sort of, right? So I, I'm really impressed with what Apple is doing. Um, and I don't work for Apple. Um, it is cross-platform, and it's cross-platform on all the platforms that matter. Windows, BSD, Linux, Mac, iOS, Android, uh, you know, it runs on all this stuff. Um, the one caveat is might not run on some bizarro uh, embedded system that you have out there. But it is LVM based, so if you have LVM there, it will run. Um, other things that are important is that the memory management, the way that they do garbage collection is reference counting. So reference counting is pretty good when it comes to determinism. Yes, I know there's caveats, we can talk about that, but the reality is that it is, it is very stable. Like I said, you leave the game running overnight, doesn't change the memory usage. Um, it has also recently introduced a Rust style borrow system. So if you don't want to pay the price of reference counting, you can always use borrow and it will copy the values without doing reference counting and the compiler will ensure the correctness. Um, what else? Uh, I think those are the key elements. In terms of IDEs, there's two big IDEs. Visual Studio Code, if you're into that and you want GitHub Copilot, or Xcode, which I happen to think is very, very pretty. Uh, some people say it's a buggy and old IDE, but I don't think they've tried it in the last few years. It's, it's really a delight to use. But, you know, if you like VS Code, by all means, go use VS Code. Now, here's a list of, uh, uh, of high-level features that might not be uh, things that you're familiar with on the C-Share board. So I'm going to touch on a few of these, right? And, 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 and this is a DALI-generated image. First go, it's incredible. Um, so... Uh, perhaps the most important thing is that Swift is a statically compiled language. Now, you might not know this, but in C Sharp, we cannot AOT compile a series of idioms. They're just not theoretically possible to compile. That includes virtual, virtual generic methods. And you might have seen that there are things that breaks at runtime. So this is very different because everything that you write that the compiler compiles will run. There's no runtime surprises uh, as things that are not supported. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about a few of the things that are a little bit different from Swift and C Sharp. First, they, there is a very strong notion in Swift about what is a variable and what is a constant. And they use the values var where you can modify and let that you, can modi you cannot modify. You're probably thinking, okay, I got that, not that interesting. But it is important for something that will come up in a second. Um, the parameters that come into a function are led by default. That means that you cannot modify them. There is no modification of those parameters. And we'll get to that in a second. The other thing that is very interesting, and this is when I first started to realize, oh, maybe there's something in Swift that I'm not getting. Uh, the first time I sat down with someone and they explained this to me. And it is that collections are copy and write. Right? So if you make a copy of an array, Right? If you have an array and you make a copy of the array and you make changes to that array, those changes are local to that array. Right? They're not the same as the original one. So the original one remains unchanged. So when you pass an array to a function, right? when you pass an array to a function, uh, in C sharp, you know, shenanigans can happen. Right? They can poke at things, remove things, delete things, change things. Uh, but in Swift, you can't. In Swift, when you pass an array, you, know, you can't change it. If you want to make changes, you've got to make a copy. You do a var assignment, A equals B, and then you make changes, and then your copy gets the changes, right? I, I think it's on my next slide. So, for example, in this case, if I try to do, a, to do an append on the structure, it's like, no, this is a let. You cannot make changes to your array. This is, um, we'll come back to this in a, se in a second, too, uh, because this is part of, uh, of, uh, of what makes actors work. The other thing, and this is the actual billion dollar fix, right, is in Swift, um, there is no null. There are no objects that are null, right? The, this null value does not exist. Um, instead, what they do is they introduce a structure called optional that can either have a value or this special thing called nil. It just happens that as implementation detail is zero. But the point is that 
you're not allowed to compile this code, right? In this case, I'm saying, uh, you know, the monster could be null, right? It's a reference object. It could be null. And I cannot compile that code because the compiler says, listen, that thing could be null. So you got to do some checks. You got to do some checks. New York C Sharp has some of this, but in a, in a way that I strongly disagree with. Um, and we can talk about that later. But the compiler won't let you compile this. So there's two ways that you can fix this. One of them is you can uh, use what is called the guard statement. And the guard statement, what it says is, hey, assign to the variable enemy right, itself if it's not null, otherwise return. So if it's null, it will return. The function doesn't run. And the rest of the code will essentially you know, take the binding that enemy is not null. So you know that it's not null. Cannot be null. It is not null. It will not crash because of a null. Right? The second one is the if version. Same thing. If let enemy, it says, well, if enemy is null, then do not execute this piece of code. Otherwise, during this if block, enemy is assumed to be not null. That will never crash with a null reference exception. Never. Cannot do it. No. Proven. Unless there's a ray cosmic shit uh, happening. Um, now, I want to share a personal lesson. Um, you know, in Swift, there's a way to say, hey, listen, I know what I'm doing. For reasons, for very valid reasons, you might have an optional type. And because you're an expert like me, you'll say, you'll say, please do not bother me. I know that this will never be null. It will never be null. I know, I know because I know the code base, and, and I know what I'm doing, right? I know. And, um, and the interesting thing about this thing, so you can use this operator called the bang operator and say, hey, listen, I know it's not null. Just to reference that thing, I know it's going to be there. Um, and if it's not, it's going to crash at runtime. But here's the interesting thing. Um, Every time I check the crash logs for my apps, right, when you go to, uh, what is it called, the uh, Firebase, right, and you go to Crashlytics to look at your crashes, 90% of them is like, who the, f oh, oh, that was me, that was me. <laughs> that was like, how, this is not supposed to happen. And the reality is that these bugs, uh, you, you got to understand that code is, you might have a series of constraints in your mind about how the program works, but those constraints might not be shared across the whole team, right? So as the team makes changes, you know, those constraints might not be satisfied. Or even worse, over time, you forget the code and you introduce changes and then you're even fighting your older self, right? So the older self knew what it was doing, the newer self doesn't, and now it all breaks. So, I mean, the reality is that a lot of my crashes comes out to every single time is like, oh, somebody assumed it was not gonna be the case and the user found a creative way of, you know, making that a null. So anyways, another one that is super interesting is uh, this thing. Uh, this is a runtime feature, though. This is a runtime feature. Uh, Swift is able to track uh, uh, concurrent access uh, to data. So if you have an object and you're making modifications to it, and then you make another modification at the same time, then the compiler would tell you, hey, two people are trying to modify the same variable, and you will get a nice crash. Right, so these are actual problems that you run into. Or you have the typical variable that is iterating over an array, and then you modify the array because like, oh, I got to update, add elements, remove elements, and then you get a nice crash, right? Usually, you would get a random behavior or other things. In Swift, they tell you, no, you have simultaneous access. And a lot of this is rooted on Apple having to deal with people trying to actively exploit the platform. So a lot of these things come from there. I just happen to appreciate those as a programmer that has been dealing with this for years. Um, I'm going to show you another one. This is taken, uh, not the, the method name, but this is actually taken from the monosource code. This is a piece of code, and this is an exploitable bug. This is an actual exploitable bug. We had to fix this about 10 years ago. We had to go through the entire code base and fix the bug. And can anybody spot where the bug is? This is an exploitable security hole. You can do that, yes, but also if you're at the edge of the value, you can also overflow. Correct. Yes. So that's the problem. Overflow causes this. So the right solution to this is to do this thing, right? This is a fixed version. Uh, so if you use this pattern, uh, there's some checks that are missing, actually. There's some checks that are missing for the, the length being positive. But uh, this is how you avoid the overflow. I didn't put all the code there, but you can see it in the monosource code. Um, so what is nice about Swift is that Swift assumes that we're not going to trust the programmer to get this right. So uh, arithmetic in, uh, in Swift checks for overflow by default. So in this case, I assign to the value score the maximum integer value, right, in dot max. That's the equivalent of max int in C. And then if I say score equals score equals one, that crashes. 
right? So it's better be safe than sorry. And again, this is, I think, something that comes from Apple's having to deal with people abusing the system at scale. Right. Now, some of you, like me, know what we're doing. So all of us that know what we're doing and we never commit any mistakes, uh, they have the YOLO operator, right? <laughs> and uh, so you just say N plus, N minus, and all those, and it will not check for overflow, right? So, you know, some of us know that the I variable can only go from 1 to 10. Um, there's some interesting features for concurrency. For example, in this case, I'm creating an array of uh, five values, one to five, and then I launch uh, an asynchronous task and, uh, and I print the value, right? But if I try to modify this thing externally, right, it's going to tell me, hey, you're mutating a variable and there's a race condition. So what is very interesting is that Swift has a series of annotations and features to track changes that can be done externally. So in this case, it assumes that A, that you're relinquishing A, and it will go to the task. But if you try to use it externally, it's like, hey, this has been used. And there's a lot more in this vein. So a lot of work to support multi-threaded applications. Finally, discriminated unions are a super neat feature. Uh, it's essentially, they're very popular in, in F Sharp. Uh, they're very popular in, in other functional languages. Um, but it lets you essentially add payloads to your enumerations. In C, sometimes you can use it with unions. There's all kinds of hacks to do it. It's not very pretty. But it lets you write code like this, right? So for, exa uh, so for example, uh, you know, the first one has no payload. So I just say, if the case is start, do this. Uh, the second one is a, uh, is, is, uh, it has a value, and it will only match that case if the enemy level is three, right? So it writes some nice code for you, and the enemy type is an orc. The second one says it doesn't matter what the level is as long as it's a ship, right? And uh, uh, the other one assigns uh, uh, coordinates and a location name, right? And the last one handles the rest, right? So this is, you know, just payloads. It's nice to reason in those terms. Now, this is one of my favorite features, and, the re and this is why I actually got interested in Swift before any of this happened, uh, which is when they were explaining to me this thing about the arrays being copy and write. And it was because they said, well, our long-term vision, the long-term vision of Swift is to have this support for actors. And actors are classes that have their data fully isolated. And the only way that you can send data to the actor is through data types that are threat safe, and data types that are threat safe on the way out. But internally, they're going to stay consistent. And if you have multiple threads calling into the actor, all of the threads essentially stop at the entrance and wait for the code to exit. So there can only be one execution thread inside an actor. And the compiler guarantees this, right? Now, I heard about actors many years ago from a researcher that was working in a language called Pony. And he described the idea as like, well, this is beautiful. I understand. I hear you, brother. I like what you're thinking. I like where you're going with this. But it will never catch on. And there's no language that can support this today. And I'm not going to switch my code to Pony, right? And you know, when the Swift people told me this is where we're going, I was like, I don't think you're going to pull it off. I don't think you're going to pull it off. And they pulled it off. Um, so I am, I am incredibly impressed with this. Not only does it simplify all your, my multi-threaded bugs, but it has caught so many of my bugs. It is insane how many bugs that I have. It's like, OK, let me move to actors so I can reason about this. And again, I'm not a great programmer. I'm an OK programmer, but I thought that I knew my threads. And the reality is that you don't. You can't reason about this at scale. You can't, you can't, you just can't. So this is really a very neat way of thinking about how to structure your code. Um, another thing that is super nice about Swift is they have their build system is integrated with the package manager. They're not two separate things. It's similar in spirit to Rust in this way. Um, but I love this thing and includes everything from publishing documentation to building your things, creating libraries, doing dependency management, uh, tracking binaries, and so on. Um, uh, oh, I didn't run my timer. What time is, am, am, am I? Okay. All right. Let's talk about the meat of the thing. So. Um, as you can imagine, I think that, I mean, first of all, if you're happy with C Sharp and with your workflow with C Sharp, by all means continue using C Sharp and by all means continue using whatever you're using. I don't want to sell you on something else. But I think that after inflicting this pause on, what is it, a 30% of the games on the App Store and every other thing in the world, that I owe it to the world to at least provide an escape hatch. So. <laughs> It is, a, it is a sense, I, I'm sorry I screwed you, and, uh, and at least I'm going to make it right. And I hope that, you know, if you care, that, you know, you'll spare me the, the, the insults. Um, you know, I, I'm doing it for you because I feel bad. Um, 
So what is Swift Godot? So Swift Godot uses the GD extension. So first of all, just so you know, I wanted to land Swift into Unity, right? Initially, years ago, I was like, oh, maybe I should put Swift into Unity. They should go this way. It's impossible. It's impossible because they don't have the patience, the interest, the desire, the community, doesn't matter. But Godot gave me that opportunity. With Godot, I have an open source foundation, and, a, and GD extension uh, solves a lot of my problems. I, I had a previous binding on the previous thing. I can't remember what it's called. Um, and I had to throw it away. Yeah, that one, that one. So I had to throw it away. In fact, it's a shame because if you Google Swift Godot, it still finds the other one instead of this one. Anyways, uh, so Swift Godot, uh, it's, th this is the right link, <laughs> uh, uses the new GD extension. It works with Godot 4.1. Um, and uh, it's all MIT license, right? I'll work on 4.2 when it comes out. I don't have enough bandwidth to track right now 4.2. Um, and I Swiftify the API. So, uh, you know, so you want your Swift code to look like Swift code. So I had to do a little shenanigans I'll show you. Uh, but it looks like Swift APIs. And I tried to learn as much as I can from the Rust binding, the C++ binding, the, the Dart binding, the Java binding. So it is great that there's a massive ecosystem of languages that I can learn from. Um, and, you know, if those are your thing, by all means, do that, right? Uh, but Again, I, I do have a little bit of a crush on Apple platforms. Not all of you. You don't understand, but us of us <laughs> that live at the intersection of uh, arts, no, liberal arts and, and technology. Anyways, we love Apple APIs. They're very pretty. And you can use all of their APIs from, uh, from Swift Godot. So it's very nice. Um, this is what the documentation looks like. So let me, let me show you uh, one of, oh, how do I do this? How do I click on this thing? Oh, how do I click on the thing? Okay, all right. So this is the documentation that is generated. Oh, is that on the screen? How do I do that? Uh-huh. Oh, do I need to do escape on the other one? Mm, PowerPoint, can I stop it? Woo, I cannot even get to PowerPoint. <gasps> it is PowerPoint, it is PowerPoint. Okay, let me exit this thing. Let me exit this thing. So, and show. And then I'm going to go back to the other thing. So you're going to see all my tabs. Okay. So this is the documentation uh, that uh, Swift generates. This is the Apple documentation system. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, but let me give you an idea of what the API looks like. So for example, if I go to Node 3D, for example, uh, where's that? Uh, Node 3D, Gizmo? No, we don't want that one. We want this one, right? So this is the documentation that is generated. I use the, uh, I match the names to the documentation in the APIs, and I extract it, and I, and I apply the same transformations that I do to the API so that you actually can get a Swiftified version of the documentation as well. Um, I honestly think that the best thing that you can do for your users is have documentation, and not having documentation is not only a crime, but uh, you shouldn't be allowed to write code. And the engine of Godot has very few comments. <laughs> um, I'm just saying, some of us think that it could use more inline comments. Um, but this is what it looks like. So you can see that I changed the, I changed the casing in a bunch of places. Uh, there's a couple of other things that are interesting. For example, in Swift, you pass the name of the parameter um, in there. And there's a couple of things, like for example, you notice, for example, here that there is no name for the first parameter. And that is because this function is called look at from position, and the first argument is called position. So in Swift, the, the, the idiom is you drop that, so you don't have redundant names, right? Uh, the other thing that is, uh, that is interesting uh, is uh, we use a tutorial system for, uh, uh, we use Apple's tutorial system, and this was contributed by Marquis. I didn't write this. He contributed this thing, but uh, it has a walkthrough of how to create your, your package from the beginning. Uh, this is the same thing that Apple uses to document their frameworks. So it tells you exactly what changes you're making, how you have to make them, how to compile this thing. Now, this, is, this documentation system is not bound to Swift. If you want to use this on your GD script or C++ or C Sharp or whatever, you can use this to write tutorials. It is incredible. We're using it for our product. We have a product that has nothing to do with gaming, and we use it for that too. Um, so it is not bound to this. You can just use this thing. It's very neat. It's very nice. It has great accessibility. I mean, everything. it checks all the boxes, right? This is some professional build documentation system. and. Uh, 
again, like I said, I love people that write documentation. I love people they spend their lives writing documentation tools. And uh, we built some for Mono. They were never remotely as good as this thing. We built some at Microsoft. We never got anything as good as this. I mean, I am in awe at just how incredible this thing is. So let's go back to the presentation and slideshow from current side. How am I doing in time? Um, I lost track. Okay, we can, we can make it happen. We can make it happen. So this is 10 minutes. This is 10 minutes for the Q&A or 10 minutes to the end? Oh, we got time. Okay. Um, this is what a sample piece of code looks in, uh, in Swift Godot. Uh, it should be very familiar to most of you. The, uh, uh, the interesting elements, and uh, the interesting elements is you have that add Godot sign that does, oh, the add Godot sign that does the class registration. Um, the hashtag, right? So hashtag signal, that creates a signal declaration. So I'm creating a signal with the name scored and it takes one argument, right? And that one uh, in the sample cut at the bottom shows how to, to emit it. So just call emit, scored, and the parameter, right? So it is all strongly typed, it's beautiful. Um, the add callable attribute surfaces the method to other Godot extensions. So the same thing that you would do with the, with the attributes in C Sharp. Um, the export is just different samples of how you can export a variable. You've seen this thing in GDScript, and you've seen this thing also with, uh, with C Sharp. It's the same thing. So you can export resources, and it will put the metadata about those things. So like that far would, would give you a, a file entry that you can click on, and you would get the, the thing there. Um, the way that we handle overrides is we override the function from Swift, uh, uh, from Swift that it's an override. Um, you can see already some of the, I'm not supposed to go there. You can see already, for example, vector, vector two, the constructor takes two arguments and you see the parameter names, right? X colon, Y colon. And uh, while it's a little bit tedious at the beginning for some of us going from C sharp, on the long term, when you're reading somebody else's code, it's like, oh, oh I know what this is. Because otherwise it's like parameters are just things, right? And, and you, you can't figure out what it is. So, um, so this is what it looks like. And lastly, the one thing that is a little bit of a clunky is this thing where we actually have to register which types need to go into Godot. Now, um, I have done a bunch of bindings in my life. So we did GTK Sharp. We did iOS. We did Android. We did Xamarin Forms. Uh, we did Urho. And what we did with every one of these is that we use reflection. In C Sharp, it's very common to use reflection. So you put all of those attributes that you had there, you embed them on the metadata, and then uh, at runtime, you scan the assembly, you get all the classes with the attributes, or you get the method, you get all the attributes, and then you do something with it. And in every single one of these things, I don't know how, why I didn't catch up on this earlier, but in every single one of these things that I mentioned, uh, years down the line, as applications grow in scope, uh, the biggest problem that you have for performance is that startup, you're doing all this assembly scanning, method scanning, uh, you know, class scanning, you all these things, you repeat them over and over. So in every single one of these cases that I mentioned, we ended up with an additional build step. So instead of doing it at runtime, now we have to code paths, the runtime path, and then the pre-compilation path where we do this, we pre-compile and then we generate. Um, Luckily, C Sharp now has uh, source generators, right? And with source generators, essentially, all of this that we used to do is going away. Uh, with Swift, I skipped directly and I went straight to the macros. So it does effectively, Swift macros are essentially source generators for Swift. It's a different name, same beast. They're sort of same beast. Um, anyways, that's all we have. Um, so an interesting lesson there. Um, then. In addition to Swift Godot, which is this framework for building, you know, adding Godot, uh, adding Swift to your Godot app, uh, you know, I don't have the patience to test this thing and launch Godot, test this thing and launch Godot, and I don't have the hot reload support yet. Um, so um, what I, what I did is I took a, there's a very nice patch on the on the pull requests uh, for libgodot, and it's a patch that lets you. Uh, treat Godot as a library and embed it as a library. Um, so I use this for doing all my testing, but the other nice advantage is you can build apps that launch Godot and, you know, it's just a thing in there. Um, and uh, you can just reference it from Swift. If you have an app, you just reference that thing, it downloads it, compiles it, and you're off to the races. Um, now I have a long laundry list of things I would like it to do, and I haven't had time to do it, right? Um, 
and uh, a gentleman just messaged me last night that said we have all of the oh it's you we have all of these features fixes for you and the the client is willing to upstream it which is having multiple scenes in different views so we can embed different views in an app uh, and put it in swift ui view so anyways i'm very happy that i know who the client is actually because they asked me would you be willing to work on this like no <laughs> No, I have an actual other thing to do. All right, future directions. Um, I would love to chat to folks at the conference about additional metadata and GD extension. One of the problems that I have right now with GD extension is that I have no way of knowing if a class that is being passed to me will be nullable or not, optional or not. So I have to assume everything is optional. So I have to always check. And I think that in a bunch of places, I can, I can safely know this is never going to be null. Right? So I would love to do that, and that would improve not only Swift, which I think is the best language in the world, but also would improve the lesser languages in the world, like C Sharp and whatever's the other one written there. Um, what? Then, uh, for example, what? You can see here, for example, I have this variable in scene, in scene tree, right, called root, and I don't know if it can be null or not. I don't know. I mean, but I would like to have that annotation so that my users don't have to deal with this. Or, for example, this callback, short input, right, in node. I don't know if that input event can ever be null. I don't know. I would like to remove the check. I do have right now an internal data structure where I keep track of everything that is not null. It's kind of a hack. But I would like it to be in J extension. But for example, this one became very popular. Input is very common, and I know it can never be null. So I annotated that one as not null, so we don't have to do this. There are other things that I want to do, uh, and I need your help because I don't know how to do it. But I wrote the editor plugin so you can go into Godot and say, this is a Swift language extension, and it lets me write my Swift language extension. But then it's very bizarre because I have two extensions in the same directory. I need some help. Um, things that I want to do, hard reloading. I'm waiting for Fortitude to go stable. I don't have time to do it on my spare time. Um, the, I wanna track, I'm tracking the work stream that people are discussing about how to improve the C-sharp performance. So everything that you can do for C-sharp, I'll, I'll lift here. Uh, there's things like I want to replace the calls to Godot through the G extension for vector and just use uh, SIMD. Um, Apple has great SIMD support, so I just want to use that. And one super neat thing is that Swift, like Go, lets you use SDK so you can deploy and build binaries for all the platforms, right? So I would love to have a thing where I can just add Swift code and it generates all the binaries for me. So all of this is there. I just need to wire it up. Um, my Swift community. Uh, this was something that I started doing. I did it last year, then I had to throw it away, then I had to start again in March or April. And, um, you know, I had a couple of users, very nice users. Nathan is not listed. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I not list Nathan? <sighs> sorry, Nathan. Um, but uh, then the summer came, and, you know, I came back, and I was distracted with Reality Kit, and it's so neat, and I'm having fun with Vision OS. And then Unity just uh, shot themselves in both feet, <laughs> and uh, the arms, and the mouth, and the whole thing. and all of a sudden, there's a lot of interest in Swift Godot. There's a lot of new contributors uh, coming in, pitching in uh, uh, help. And uh, you, if you're interested, we have a Slack channel. We don't do uh, Discord, uh, but we use uh, Slack. And, and they're a great community, a uh, great group of folks uh, that just came out of nowhere. Now, this is, the, this is the one that is a little bit debatable. Well, not debatable. I mean, this is the right thing, but you guys might not accept it at first. But I'm going to let it sink. Just let it simmer. Let it simmer, and you'll come to terms with the fact that I'm right. So. I think that, uh, you know, I strongly believe that nobody should be writing more C and C++ code. I think it's a crime. It's a crime against humanity. We shouldn't be doing it anymore. Don't do it. Don't do it. And I think that you should do it with Swift. I had a slide about this. So, um, honestly, life is too short <laughs> for this shit. I, I can't debug another race condition. I can't debug another null. No, please, stop. Stop it. Right? I don't, I don't want to deal with more member corruption issues. And, uh, and I think that it is our duty, it is our duty for future generations to not do this. So we got to stop it. Now, I understand, I understand, I'm also a practical man. I'm a practical man. I understand we can't throw away all of the beautiful C++ Godot code. It's there, it works, it's functional. So, uh, so what happened recently is that Apple launched uh, Swift 5.9 in September. And Swift 5.9 is the first version of the language that allows C++ interoperability. And what it lets you do, right, is it lets you consume, well, I'll get to that in a second, but um, first of all, um, I don't believe that we can rewrite all the C and C++ code. I think that new code should not be C and C++, but 
I don't think that we should rewrite existing working code. I think it's a disaster. And I think that it, it is also a fallacy that a lot of uh, younger people fall into. Um, but I think that we should start migrating over, right? Um, now, Apple, for this, like I mentioned before, they have security concerns, and I think that those are also valid. But they also have this thing called Foundation DB, and that thing powers iCloud. Um, it's a distributed ACID database they acquired, and they open source, and uh, they finally migrated this code base to a blended C++ and Swift code base. So it's what runs those production systems. This is what every iCloud device, billions of devices are using, and it's now blended C++ and Swift code. So to give you a taste of what it can do, Swift can consume your C and C++ code, it can consume your classes, it can consume your templates, and inline functions, and inline your C++ function in Swift. The reason it can do this is because it, Swift is really syntactic sugar on top of LVM. So it's LVM and LVM, they can do that. Now, you still cannot overwrite a function from C++ in Swift yet, yet, yet. Uh, but they're actively working on this. So this is the first pass at the C++ support. It is incredibly incredible in the way that it is right now, but they're adding more capabilities. Um, so given this, you know, I was pondering out loud and uh, the other day, and I think that while the engine probably should remain in C and C++ because there is just so many platforms that we don't even know about. There might be NDA platforms that we don't know exist that Godot needs to target. But the editor, on the other hand, realistically, it's Windows, Linux, Mac, and WASM, and, and Android. Android? Yeah. Android, all right. <laughs> all of this, let me edit it, it also supports Android. But, uh, but the editor works well on all of these platforms, right? So I think that we should also treat ourselves, right? I was hacking on the editor the other day. It's like, God, I mean, it crashed on a null reference. Yes, it was my fault, but it crashed, <laughs> right? The compiler should have taught me, you, you shouldn't do that, you dumbass, right? So, um, so I think that we should start moving there. So I have been working on a proof of concept where I am replacing chunks of the editor with Swift code. Now, it, it, to be fair, it's not a super usable piece right now because I'm doing Swift UI for some of the UI elements because I happen to like that UI more. But, <laughs> But I think that this is the direction that we should go. And do I still have time? I think it's only five minutes, but uh, I did it. We do indeed have five minutes, slightly less because of this huge applause. And we have the first question. Thank you very much. I actually have two questions that are both short. Um, first of all, I may be misunderstanding that. This um, I was under the impression that GD script was not uh, vulnerable, was not uh, wouldn't get these sort of uh, stutters, but because it didn't use a garbage collector. Yeah, m yeah. My objection is not with GD script. Ah, okay. It's with C sharp. Okay. And I love C sharp. It's my baby. I wrote a compiler. Mm -hmm. I spent twelve years writing the compiler. Anyways, yes, it's okay, my baby. So but we can't fix it. Right. And the second question, very important. Yes. Now, I admit, I've, I'm not very familiar with Swift or the people who use yes. it, but I must know, do we call them Swifties? <laughs> Oof. Oh. Uh, Swifterista? <laughs> All right, yes. Um, with this blend of C++ and Swift code, um, I, 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 you didn't really explain this. Does this work like Cgo, where basically you replace your no. C++ compiler with like, okay. No. So you still have like a real C++ compiler? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, remember, Swift is, Swift is syntactic sugar on top of LVM, right? And th there's some persons working on, on the GCC integration for people that want to use GCC. But uh, at the end of the day, yes, you have a real C++ compiler and you have a real uh, Swift compiler. In the case of LVM, they both end up being bit code, LVM bit code, and then you run those two and it optimizes over those two boundaries. Yeah. Oh, there was, uh, you, you went there? Sorry. Uh, the thing is that we current, so you Alf answered while I asked, I, I answered, I, I put my hand up, but basically we're using GCC as the main compiler, LVM is more like an optional semi-supported thing, like it's, yeah. it's not the main piece of the Okay, that's so it's not the main piece of the cake. I get it. I get it. Well, we'll 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 get you over to the right side of the world, but yeah, <laughs> it's okay. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, sure, but on at least on Android and uh, I mean at least on Mac platforms, LVM is the really the only choice that you have. So I mean, we know that Godot works on LVM. I, I, we know it because that's the only thing I use. Um, I haven't installed GCC in, in, in ages. Uh, but but to address your concerns, there are people that are looking into doing, uh, it's called module map. Uh, it's a thing that's called module map to do integration with C++. And there are people looking into that. That said, you know, give it a, sh give it a shot. That'll be amazing. <laughs> Chef Kiss. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. And I love you bringing in these new, new ideas. It was very refreshing. And uh, so as a recovering Apple fanboy for five years, so I, I've been oh, uh, recovering. doing... recovering. <laughs> was it recovering? So I lo used to love it. I still like it, but I'm... Off. I, so I used to do iOS development, for, and I love Swift. Um, but there were some annoying things with reference counting. And I remember the most annoying things is like uh, when you do a call a web service and asynchronous comes back and you have this lambda, right? Yes. And you need to have a strong reference inside. Yes, but correct. a weak reference back because correct. otherwise you have memory Yes, leaves, you have a cycle. Yes. And um, it's easy to mess this stuff up. Correct. I still prefer that to, um, to, to garbage collection. So I, I will take it right. in day. So but can you comment on the problems with uh, yes. reference counting? Absolutely. Things? Reference counting has a problem that is that you can introduce strong cycles and you cannot get rid of those. Um, Python, for example, tells you how to break cycles. And you got to understand how do you break cycles. And usually, when you have a parent having a, a child and the child points to the container, right? Uh, so you have to use weak. Yes, it is a problem. The solution historically has been you profile and you identify these cycles. So at least on, uh, you know, uh, gprof does it, and uh, so does Xcode. They both can show you where you have cycles. It is a problem, yes. Uh, and there is no automated break the cycle solution. Um, but it is much preferable than just the process that you have no control because at least this you run the profiler and you know where the leaks are right it tells you this is a leak and this is a cycle name and in xcode at least it shows you a little graph that says this is how the cycle is created uh, with the other one you can't do anything you can pray to the gods and you can put a uh, lipstick on the pig but you're out of luck really so yes it is a real problem but you kind of learn to deal with it and there was a question on the back uh, I have a garbage collector question. Yes. Um, are you familiar with, and do you have a take on the Golang garbage collector? Uh, I am familiar superficially. So, uh, yes, I am familiar with uh, a lot of the techniques in garbage collectors because we had we initially took Bohem, and then we had to implement our own copying collector. So you get to learn a ton about the subject. Uh, yes, I'm familiar with Go. I know what they're doing. It is not what we need. It's not enough for what we need. Um, I, like I said, I think that there, I have some backup slides. There is a solution. It's just there's no money, there's no capital, and there is no desire. You know, you really, you are really looking at a four to five year effort to wire up what is uh, what is essentially a puzzles collector. There is one in the industry that I know of. The only one that is commercial grade available comes from Azul Systems, which is a company that does uh, VMs for Java. It is commercial, state of the art, puzzles, incredible but it is also very pervasive, right? Very, very pervasive. So it could be done if there's political will and capital, but it will take years to get this in place. Now, Azul can get away with a lot of things that .NET can't, right? So for example, I tried to put reference counting in .NET years ago. I was like, this has got to be possible. It's got to be possible. It's got to be possible. Let's do it. Let's do reference counting, even if there are cycles. We'll deal with the cycles later. Let's do it, guys. The problem is that there's a thing called inner pointers that doesn't give you enough information, so you can't actually do reference counting. So by design, we cannot do reference counting in .NET. With Java, you can. I mean, in fact, the old versions, uh, there were prototypes of this because the design allowed for it. .NET is a lot more flexible, and sadly, the information that we need to implement this is gone. So while well, Azul is able to do this for Java, I am not sure if it's going to be possible for .NET. So even if we did all of the other work, to get it pauseless, there's a lot of details that are still very complicated. So there's a lot of open research subjects. But if you're interested, the C4 paper from Azul has a lot of the pointers. And you know, if you want to start your career in GCs, this might be one of the best things that you can do for humanity as well. Um, that said, there's not a lot of job openings, right? And if you look at the staff that people have for GC expert, it is much, much smaller, much, much smaller than you can imagine. So it is, uh, it is grim out there. But you know, th that's what social service is for. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you.